Well, I want to talk about uh, three things, uh, which are, of course, uh, connected to each other. One is uh, Tolkien's own personal beliefs. Another is uh, the way that these uh, pop up in, uh, in fiction. And the third is to attempt to relate this to what Tolkien certainly thought of as a, a continuing tradition of literature, which we had mostly forgotten about. Well, let me begin with the, uh, the personal side. <clears throat> My title is uh, Trees, Chainsaws, and Visions of Paradise. So I'll start off with the trees. I think we can say that uh, Tolkien's credentials as a tree hugger are uh, absolutely clear. Uh, one very good example is the account he gave of uh, the story Leaf by Niggle. He said that this story came to him in a dream. Uh, he woke up with it in his head. And he said, um, I awoke with it already in mind. One of its sources was a great-limbed poplar tree that I could see even lying in bed. It was suddenly lopped and mutilated by its owner. I do not know why. It's cut down now, a less barbarous punishment for any crimes it may have been accused of, such as being large and alive. I do not think it had any friends or any mourners, except myself and a pair of owls. <laughs> well, there's Tolkien, you know, in good tree-hugging mode, uh, and also, of course, uh, treating trees as, as people, really, who can be lopped and mutilated. But he says, of course, that this uh, went back uh, much further in his life. Uh, uh, the feeling had been with him since his childhood in the Worcestershire village of Serhole. Uh, again, this is from Humphrey Carpenter's biography. There was a willow hanging over the mill pool, and I learned to climb it. It belonged to a butcher on the Stratford Road, I think. One day they cut it down. They didn't do anything with it. The log just lay there. I never forgot that. However, perhaps the best example of this uh, comes from a, a colleague of mine, now a professor at Harvard, who tells this anecdote, which I shall rapidly pirate. Uh, he said that uh, some, it must have been at least 30 years ago, when he was a student uh, backpacking his way around Europe, he uh, found himself in Oxford, and he went to the university parks. And he found a bench there and took his backpack off and sat down on the bench and looked at the, the, the parks for a bit. And at this point, um, an old guy came up, very well dressed. And he came along and he sat down on the bench and he started to talk um, about trees. Uh, trees, how beautiful they were. Trees, some particularly beautiful trees. Trees, you know, some trees he was personally fond of. Trees, the awful things people did to trees. Trees, how awful people were who did these awful things to trees. Trees, what we ought to do to these awful people who do awful things to trees. But at this point, my colleague said he was beginning to get rather nervous. So he, he picked his backpack up and edged away, uh, uh, reflecting that, you know, they haven't got all the weirdos locked up yet by any means. But next morning, he uh, got the local paper and discovered a picture of the old weirdo uh, in, the, in it. And it was, of course, the distinguished Professor Tolkien, who was in the paper because he'd been collecting an honorary doctorate. Well, that, I think, again, identifies Tolkien as a, as a tree hugger and also, in a way, a tree revenger. Um, <laughs> As you can see in the fiction, I mean, I give only, only, only odd examples, but it's there all the way through. But a good example would be the party tree in uh, The Lord of the Rings. You remember that uh, its felling in the scouring of the Shire at the end is the one thing that makes uh, Sam burst into tears. Though he had already seen in the mirror of Galadriel, Ted Sandyman are cutting down trees as he shouldn't, but not, in fact, the party tree. The party tree is then replaced by the Malon tree, which is grown from a seed given him by Galadriel. So I think we can say that, uh, as far as I can make out, Tolkien did not actually hug trees, because this would be a display of emotion which would be foreign to him, but I think he, <laughs> he, he, he patted them and he stroked to them, and I'm pretty sure that he actually talked to them. <laughs> well, that's one side of it. However, there's another side, which uh, surely we can identify pretty readily as well. Uh, you've got to say that if you read Tolkien's fiction at all, you soon see that there are trees in it uh, which you would not want to meet in a dark alleyway. <laughs> Of these, the most, uh, most well, one, for, for instance, is perhaps Old Man Willow. I mean, Tolkien's very sentimental about poor willow trees that get cut down, but just the same, Old Man Willow tries to drown Frodo and snatches Merry and Pippin, and, you know, they have to be rescued from him by Tom Bombadil. And indeed, even Sam at this point, another tree hugger, says, I suppose we haven't got an axe among our luggage, Mr. Frodo. <laughs> And the hobbits, uh, in fact, don't mind felling trees either. Again, you can see in the Fellowship of the Ring, long ago the trees were told to attack the hedge that borders the Shire, but the hobbits came and cut down hundreds of trees and made a great bonfire in the forest. 
After that, the trees gave up the attack, but they became very unfriendly. <laughs> well, okay, Tolkien is quite capable of putting both sides of this, uh, this uh, uh, story, the you know, pro and anti trees. But again, as I say, you can see this really quite, quite widespread. There's a strikingly powerful account of Mirkwood in The Hobbit. And uh, let me just say, philologically speaking, that uh, the first element in Merk uh, could be argued about. Many people think that it actually means a Merk as in the word Mark or March. So it means March wood, which means the, the border wood, the wood on the border. But it's clear enough, I think, that uh, Tolkien in The Hobbit takes Merk to be from Merk as in murky. It's the dark wood. And uh, there's a long account, in fact, an eight-page account of walking through Mirkwood with uh, the dwarves and Bilbo getting increasingly depressed as they do so. It was not long before they grew to hate the forest, but they had to go on and on, long after they were sick for a sight of the sun and the sky and longed for the feel of wind on their faces. There was no movement of air down under the forest roof, and it was everlastingly still and dark and stuffy. And this goes on, as I say, for eight pages. You could say the same sort of thing, the same sort of uh, uh, two-sidedness, uh, really, about, uh, about Fangorn. Uh, Fangorn, of course, seems to be, you know, as you might expect from an ant, you know, a, a, a pretty determined tree hugger who expresses very Tolkienian feelings about people who cut down trees. He says, for instance, talking of the orcs, some of the trees they just cut down and leave to rot. Very like what Tolkien said about, you know, what happened to him in Serho. Curse him, root and branch. Many of those trees were my friends. I think I've located things like that in Tolkien before. Uh, creatures I had known from nut and acorn. There are wastes of stump and bramble where once there were singing groves. Okay, well that's the, the kind of tree hugger aspect of Fangorn. Very like Tolkien. On the other hand... Fangorn, going on, uh, discusses, as it were, the way that uh, the trees, you know, start to wake up and become ants. And he says, when that happens to a tree, you find that some have bad hearts. Nothing to do with their wood. I don't mean that. There are some trees in the valleys under the mountains, sound as a bell and bad right through. Uh, that sort of thing seems to spread. There used to be some very dangerous parts in this country. We do what we can. We keep off strangers and the foolhardy, and we train and we teach. We walk and we weed. Well, uh, Fangorn, then, is, uh, is, is partly a tree shepherd, but also a tree weeder. And I think, I'm not quite sure how ants do weed trees, but I think that means that they, too, like the hobbits, will cut them down. Well, what I'd say is, then, that uh, Tolkien's tree-hugging, though very obvious, was not unconditional. He loved trees uh, one at a time, but when they get together and form gangs... Uh, <laughs> As in a wood or a forest, well, forests in Tolkien are often not pleasant places, but they do have a role to play. And that role, and I now turn away from Tolkien's personal life and his fiction, that role, I think, is quite clear, uh, as it were, in the, in the traditional literary imagination. If you think about uh, forests in English literature, there is a, you know, there's a lot of them. And indeed, I could list them, uh, some of them, of course, not, not, not just in English literature. Uh, uh, my, my general rule is that you cannot have a good romance without a forest to put it in. You must have a forest there. Forests include Brocéliande, uh, the famous uh, forest of Merlin, or Sherwood Forest, or the Forest of Arden, or Vallombrosa, or in, uh, in 20th century literature, the Wild Wood uh, of Winnie the Pooh, and the Forest Sauvage of T.H. White's The Once and Future King, and Tinchervall's Wood in Jack Vance's uh, series uh, you know, quite recently. Okay. Lots and lots of forests. One can make quite an extensive list of them. But what's the point of a forest or a wood? What do you use it for? Well, I would have said that uh, uh, if you look back at, uh, at uh, uh, the poem The Fairy Queen, which I think Tolkien didn't like, uh, but he was going to read anything which had fairy in the title. I think he knew it quite well. The first thing that happens in The Fairy Queen, of course, is the Red Cross Knight finds himself in the wood. And the wood is the wood of capital letter ERA, the wood of ERA. It's an allegorical wood. Uh, anyway, the characters go into the wood, and then it says, um, When weaning to return, whence they did stray, they cannot find that path which first was shown, but wander to and fro in ways unknown, furthest from end then, when they nearest wean, that makes them doubt their wits be not their own. So many paths, so many turnings seen, that which of them to take, in diverse doubt they been. So, the wood is the wood of error, and the thing about the wood of error is you go in and you get lost and you can't find your way out again. One might uh, reflect also on another famous wood, uh, the enchanted wood in Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, it's a funny thing about Shakespeare. There are several funny things about Shakespeare. Um, <laughs> Tolkien, I think, regarded him with uh, disapproving interest. 
uh, he felt, as I did, that Shakespeare um, had taken the wrong turning in life. Uh, there's no doubt he was a talented poet and he could have been good. Unfortunately, he went off to London and became commercial and turned his back on all the things that he should not have turned his back on. And one point about this is that, as far as I can make out, Shakespeare only wrote two plays himself. The rest were all borrowed plots. But the two he did himself, where the plots are not borrowed, are Midsummer Night's Dream and The Tempest which, of course, are rather like each other. There are, you might say, his fairy plays. Now, that was what he should have done, instead of going off and doing all this stuff like, well, what was it, Hamlet and King Lear? <laughs> uh, yes, uh, Shakespeare very, ne very nearly did it. But there, the, the wood, the enchanted wood in Midsummer Night's Dream, is really rather a good one. In it, you'll remember, you've got Bully Bottom and the rude mechanicals putting on their appallingly rotten play. But you've also got uh, the fairies wandering around, Oberon and Titania and Puck, and in the middle of it all you have the two pairs of lovers wandering around, you know, getting hopelessly confused. Well, again, you might say, the enchanted wood there is something like the wood of error in Spencer. And a third example uh, from Milton is in his mask uh, presented at Ludlow Castle in Shropshire, uh, his mask of Comus. Uh, the story, in the story of this, it's a fairly simple story, uh, a lady is wandering and she gets lost. She finds herself lost in a wood, but this is a very dangerous wood because it is the enchanter's wood, and the enchanter in there is a, is a, is a threat to her. But she says, uh, as, she, as she finds she's lost, oh, where else shall I inform my unacquainted feet in the blind mazes of this tangled wood? in the blind mazes of this tangled wood. A bit later, her brother, uh, her brother's looking for her, uh, says, you know, I, I really, I, I don't like this wood. I can't see anything. I can't find my way out. I wish I could hear a sound from outside it or see a ray of light from outside it. It would be some solace yet, some little cheering in this close dungeon of innumerous boughs. Well, the blind mazes of this tangled wood this close dungeon of innumerous boughs. They're saying very much the same kind of thing. And we will see that Tolkien says very much the same kind of thing too. But I'd say then that uh, in uh, the literary imagination, generally, the functions of the wood are to get lost in. And, of course, to find your way out of. The main thing about a wood, even in reality, is you can't see very far. And in particular, you can't see the sky. And so you readily lose your bearings. This, of course, is what happens to the hobbit in the old forest. It says, indeed, as they wander through the old forest down towards the, the river Wythe Windle, after an hour or two, they had lost all clear sense of direction. Well, that is what woods do to you. Now, the hobbits in the old forest try to keep their spirits up by singing. And I now need to consider, uh, as, uh, as uh, Dr. Helms has already done, the nature of hobbit poetry. And one thing about hobbit poetry, I'd say, is that it's rather like paths in the forest. It shifts all the time, and it shifts all the time for obvious reasons, which are it's oral and it's anonymous. So you can't tell, actually, who's made it up. Maybe it was Sam Gamgee, but Sam Gamgee may have been imitating, probably was imitating or ab adapting something else. But uh, we get examples of it even inside the fiction. So an early example of Hobbit poetry is Bilbo's song, which I give the first stanza of. The road goes ever on and on down from the door where it began. Now far ahead the road has gone, and I must follow if I can, pursuing it with eager feet until it joins some larger way where many paths and errands meet, and whither then, I cannot say. Well, first thing, this is almost monosyllabic. Uh, I think there's one two-syllable word in each line, but there are no difficult words there. Uh, as a result, of course, in, uh, in a culture which actually thinks that poetry should above all be difficult, this has been written off as, uh, as you know, simple and, uh, and stupid. On the other hand, it's actually got quite difficult syntax, and most of my colleagues in English departments are like the beasts that perish when it comes to syntax. They don't know any. They know a lot about words, but they don't know anything about grammar, and what they do know <laughs> is wrong. So uh, it may be actually, li like a lot of Hobbit things, it may look dumb on the surface, but as has already been said, there's more there than meets the eye. And there is in Bilbo's uh, uh, poem, I think, a strong suggestion of allegory. Uh, Tolkien didn't like the word allegory, so I won't, uh, I won't uh, use it anymore, but let, let me put it this way. It's both personal and impersonal. It's very strongly personal, because Bilbo, of course, is saying this about the road as he goes out of his door and as he goes off on a journey. So he's talking about himself. And yet, in a way, this, uh, this image of going out and, and, and getting onto the road, which goes off to meet some larger way, this could be applied in many circumstances, and it is. And if it is implied in other circumstances, then you can change it. 
Frodo repeats it, and actually he says very much the same thing, and I must follow if I can, but instead of pursuing it with eager feet, he says pursuing it with weary feet. Because, of course, he's not eager. He's not eager to follow the road at all. He'd really rather not. And somebody asks him, is that, uh, is that one of Bilbo's poems? And Frodo says, well, I'm not sure. I, perhaps it was. Maybe I heard it somewhere. He's not sure where it came from. But in any case, he's quite able to change it for himself. Uh, and again, uh, when Bilbo finally uh, repeats this song, which he does you know, near the end of The Lord of the Rings, it's quite different again. He gives the first three lines, you know, now far ahead, up to now far ahead the road is gone. And then he says, quite differently, let others follow it who can. Let them a journey now begin, but I at last, with weary feet, and he's got Frodo's that line there, not his own eager feet, but I at last, with weary feet, will turn towards the lighted inn, my evening rest and sleep to meet. And when he says that, he, he falls asleep, and the others all look at him, because they know, actually, uh, that he's dying. Uh, so by this time, the impersonal has taken over from the personal, and we realize that the road is life, and the sleep which he's looking forward to is death. Well, that's Hobbit poetry for you. It looks easy, but you can keep changing it, and it has this very strong suggestion of, as I say, personal and impersonal application at once. One could take uh, another example of this uh, uh, in the Old Forest. Uh, the Hobbits, as I say, are trying to cheer themselves up by singing as they walk through the Old Forest, and Frodo starts to sing a song which goes, O wanderers in the shadowed land, despair not, for though dark they stand, all woods there be must end at last and see the open sun go past, the setting sun, the rising sun, the day's end or the day begun. For east or west, all woods must fail. But of course, it is not a good idea to sing this in the old forest, because as soon as he says that, a tree drops a branch, crash, and Mary says, uh, just, uh, just knock off this. Uh, uh, <laughs> wait, wait till we're out of the wood. They don't like all this stuff about woods must fail. Wait till we're at the edge, and then we'll turn around and sing it. Okay. Um, but uh, you might reflect, actually, that uh, these phrases like, uh, well, what is the shadowed land? Oh, wanderers in the shadowed land. Well, personally speaking, you could say, it's, well, it's the old forest. That's where they are, isn't it? But actually, you wonder, is there not uh, a larger application of this? Certainly, when you get lines like, all woods there be must end at last, that is a general statement, a gnomic statement, which doesn't just apply to the old forest at all. So I would suggest, actually, that uh, once again, there's a strong sense here that the shadowed land that they're talking about is, is life. Uh, one day you will come out of the shadowed land and then you'll be in the clear. But while you're in it, uh, you've lost your bearings. You can't imagine anything else and you're prone, of course, to despair, a very traditional theme. And it's expressed once again in very much the same sort of way by Sam in the section The Tower of Kirith Ungol when he's trying to sing to, to attract Frodo's attention. And he starts to sing a song which goes, um, Though here at journey's end I lie in darkness buried deep, beyond all towers strong and high, beyond all mountains steep, above all shadows rides the sun and stars forever dwell. I will not say the day is done, nor bid the stars farewell. Very simple again. Actually also highly Shakespearean. That bit about, I will not say the day is done. Well, actually, that is Shakespeare. It's Antony and Cleopatra, where uh, Cleopatra says, if I remember rightly, um, uh, our bright day is done, and we are for the dark. So, day is done. Uh, very Shakespearean. Uh, of course, it's not Shakespearean. Do we think that Shakespeare invented that? Putting day and done together? No. This is proper Hobbit poetry, which Shakespeare could have written more of. <laughs> if he had not gone commercial, as I said before. <laughs> this, in fact, is something which we think, just like Hobbit poetry, is as old as the hills, and nobody can tell who first put it together. Nobody can tell who first contrasted day and dark, which is actually, if you think about it, not all that hard to do. Well, uh, just, uh, just like all the other Hobbit poems, I would say Sam's one is highly personal. When it says we're here in darkness buried deep, that's right, it's because they're in a dungeon. But it's also impersonal in exactly the same way as the others. Above all shadows rides the sun. Okay, that's a statement like east or west all woods must fail. It's a statement about eternal truth, about something which applies outside the individual circumstances of the person singing. So I would say in this kind of myth... And this is what I'm saying it is. In this kind of myth, the world is the wood. Uh, and the world is also the shadow land. And there's a road in it, which is life. And the road goes through it, but we tend to lose sight of that. At the end of life, we will come out of the wood, which has been so perplexing, and come out into another world. 
and the sun and the stars are guarantees of this other world which is outside the wood of this world, the confusing wood of this world, the bewildering, enchanted wood of this world. And I'm saying Tolkien is not by any means the only English poet to use this image. In fact, I would say, say this, there's a bit of, uh, of uh, local, local uh, prejudice now breaks out here. Uh, Tolkien, I think, would have identified five English counties as home. And these five counties are the five counties of the West Midlands. I ignore all the uh, administrative reshuffles which our wretched government keeps on trying, to, <laughs> trying to, to, to introduce and which the native population stubbornly refuses to take any notice of. <laughs> the five counties are um, Warwickshire, Staffordshire, Herefordshire, Shropshire and Worcestershire. And with each of these, a poet can be identified. Warwickshire is, of course, uh, for Shakespeare. Staffordshire is the Gawain poet, who's already been mentioned, author of Sir Gawain and Pearl. Herefordshire, uh, the author of The Anchor and a Wissa, which Tolkien made his reputation on. Shropshire, well, Milton was not a Shropshire poet, but I think M M Tolkien had probably said that Milton was pretty poor most of the time. Uh, but the only time when he got really good, he was actually writing a play to be put on in Shropshire, and perhaps the sense of the place overpowered him and put him up to a level which he normally couldn't manage. Uh, <laughs> And the only thing that annoys me in my scheme is that uh, I can't find a poet who fits Worcestershire, uh, which was Tolkien's favourite county, and the county which he regarded himself as belonging to, though I may say that the town the, 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 in Birmingham, they redid the county boundaries uh, in 1911. That's confusing everybody, and me in particular. But just the same, uh, Worcestershire was his home county, uh, and uh, who is the poet that one would associate with that? Well, certainly William Langland, but I haven't seen any sign of Tolkien liking William Langland much. I used to think it was Leoman, the author of The Brut, but careful uh, uh, analysis of, the, of the, the area shows that actually he was about five miles over the border uh, in, uh, in Shropshire. So um, I haven't been able to find a poet for Worcestershire, and if anyone can think of one, I will gladly, gladly take them over. But it will have to be a poet that Tolkien would have approved of. Well, this then, I think, is a myth, which you find in Tolkien, but which Tolkien thought, and I agree with him, is really rather widespread in early English literature. But notice another thing. It's not just the hobbits. Uh, the elves, in fact, subscribe to the myth as well. And we know, in fact, that Hobbit poetry uh, has a tendency to borrow from elvish poetry and to try to take it over. Well, we can see bits of this, uh, again, in The Lord of the Rings. One good example is the song in Quenya, in the elf Latin, which is sung near the start of uh, The Fellowship of the Ring and which drives off the Black Rider while the hobbits are still in the Shire. It's a song addressed to Elbereth, and it starts off, O oh, light to us that wander here, amid the world of woven trees. Okay, the world of woven trees, heard that before, not just from Tolkien. Uh, and the elves say, we still remember, we who dwell in this far land beneath the trees, thy starlight on the western seas. So once again, we have the opposition between the trees, where the elves are, and the starlight, which they look out to and which they remember. But this is repeated again in the Sindarin song to Elbereth, which is sung in Rivendell, Ah, Elbereth Gilthoniel. This really is, uh, I, I, I sometimes wonder how Sir Stanley Unwin ever got round to publishing The Lord of the Rings. I mean, I could just see, see the average publisher, the average publisher, faced by some well-dressed old weirdo who comes in and says, uh, hey, I've got a 1,500-page uh, uh, story. Uh, it's uh, all about creatures you don't know anything about. And uh, just to make it really exciting, I've included all kinds of poems in it in languages which nobody knows, and I haven't bothered to translate them. <laughs> but that's, that's, what he, that's what he did. He, he put the poem there in Sindarin, and he never translated it. Well, actually... Many years later, he did translate it in uh, the song cycle, The Road Goes Ever On, where it comes out, and I give the translation here, as, uh, O Elbereth, who lit the stars, from glittering crystal slanting, falls with light like jewels from heaven on high, the glory of the starry host. And then Tolkien, who was an appallingly bad proofreader, lost a bit of it. So that actually, although he wrote the translation, he didn't actually kind of finish it. Uh, and the, the lines, Nachired palandiriel, O galath remin enorath, uh, never got translated. So I've had to translate them myself. And I translate as, To lands remote I have looked afar, O Galadremin Enorath, from tree-tangled Middle Earth. Galadremin, tree-tangled. Well, the, the elves then really have the same image as the hobbits. The woods are a tangle, and the elves want to get out of the tangle to the true west, to the undying lands, which they remember. But actually they don't. 
The same ambiguity is there as between Tolkien's tree-hugging and his fear of trees. The elves actually want to get out of the trees, but they don't want to get out of the trees because they too are tree-huggers. As Haldir says, leading the fellowship into Lothlurien and fearing that the elves will one day have to flee from Middle-earth, he says, well, perhaps we will have to go to Middle-earth, we'll have to go, leave Middle-earth, go to the Undying Lands, but, he says, it would be a poor life in a land where no Malon grew. But if there are Malon trees beyond the Great Sea, none have reported it. So the elves, in a way, have the option of leaving Middle-earth and going to something like paradise, but they don't want to because they're not sure there are trees in paradise. And if there are no trees in paradise, they're not going. <laughs> and uh, I'll just say it again, the hobbits share the same ambiguity. They, too, have a myth about leaving the shadowed land and getting out of the wood, but although they want to get out of the wood in a sort of a way, they don't want to leave the trees behind. Uh, so again, there's another Hobbit song, which actually ends up, I'll just give the last bit of it, Apple, Thorn and Nut and Slow, Let Them Go, Let Them Go. Um, sand and Stone and Pool and Dell, Fare You Well, Fare You Well. The Hobbits, as it were, are saying goodbye to Middle-earth, but actually they don't want to. They don't want to leave behind the apple and the thorn and the nut and the slow. These are the little familiar hedgerow trees which you see in the English countryside. So the elves and the hobbits, you might say, have a problem in front of them. Death is seen as a release from Spencer's wood of error, but it also means parting from natural beauty. Is there a way out of this? Is it possible to make a compromise? Well, one compromise would be to say uh, that, of course, there are Malon trees uh, west of the sea, and that heaven does, in fact, have, uh, have uh, trees in it. Uh, well, this, I think, is what is said in Leaf by Niggle where Niggle eventually dies and goes off to purgatory, but when he's let out of purgatory, he finds himself in a world where his tree, which he has always been imagining, is real. So actually, in heaven, he is reunited, so to speak, with his tree. Uh, I think this is an inkling belief which was also shared by Lewis, because Lewis repeats it too. But there's another compromise, actually, which would be to say, no, uh, it's not that there are trees in, in, in heaven. Uh, actually, there's an undying land in Middle Earth. There's a paradise in this world, which is not uh, in the other world. And, of course, it's quite true. There is an undying land in Middle-earth, and this is uh, the earthly paradise. Paradise is not the same as heaven. Paradise is the Garden of Eden. And the Garden of Eden, as we well know, is shut. But it hasn't been moved. It's still there. And it is described in a work uh, by uh, Sir John Mandeville, The Travels of Sir John Mandeville, uh, which is a work written in French, between somewhere around 1360. It's a work written in French, uh, and uh, far be it from me to, uh, to engage in any, uh, any outbreaks of chauvinism, which as we know is a French invention, um, <laughs> but I just would like to point out, as Tolkien would have wished me to, that most of the really interesting works in French were written by Englishmen. <laughs> as, for instance, the Lays of Marie de France, uh, or the uh, Proverbs of Nicole de Bozon, as they call him, whose real name was actually Nick Boone, uh, a member of the Boone family, who I may point out, or Wardens of the West March. So all kinds of uh, cultural assimilation has taken place, but I am trying to take it back. So Sir John de Mandeville, who wrote the, the, the travels in French, I'm fairly sure was an English knight from Black Notley in Essex. And his work is one of the great books of the world, more popular than Marco Polo, used by Christopher Columbus, and also by Henry the Navigator. If I was writing a blurb for it, I would say, in the tradition of the letter of Alexander or the letter of Prester John. It is a work of marvels. Now, he has something to say about paradise. And since he's an Englishman, he writes it perfectly straightforwardly and honestly. He says, <laughs> Of paradise I cannot speak properly, for I have not been there, and that I regret. But I shall tell you as much as I have heard from wise men and trustworthy authorities. The earthly paradise, so men say, is the highest land on earth. It is so high it touches the sphere of the moon. For it is so high that Noah's flood could not reach it, though it covered all, that, all the rest of the world. Paradise is encircled by a wall, but no man can say what the wall is made of. There is no way into it open because of ever-burning fire, which is the flaming sword that God set up before the entrance so that no man should enter. He goes on to tell us about the four rivers which flow out of paradise, the Nile, the Ganges, the Tigris, and the Euphrates. And he says of one of these rivers, in that river are many precious stones, and there is much gold in the gravel. But he ends up by saying, seriously, you should realize that no living man can go to paradise. No man, as I said, can get there. 
except through the special grace of God. So there is an exception. You can get there, but you'll need the special grace of God. Well, uh, Mandeville's travels were known to um, the Gawain poet, whom Tolkien took an interest in all his life. Tolkien's first major uh, academic success was his edition of Sir Gawain, and he was supposed to go on with his colleague Evie Gordon uh, to, um, uh, to edit the poem Pearl by the same poet. And uh, the Gawain poet uh, is known only to have used two books beside the Bible, uh, one of which is, is Mandeville's Travels and the other is the Roman de la Rose. But Tolkien certainly knew about Mandeville's Travels and certainly knew the Gawain poet knew it too. Well, the place where we see it coming up in the Gawain poet is that is he does a description of the Dead Sea, uh, the result, he says, of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. But I think he also, the poet, has remembered the account of paradise. And you can see this from the poem Pearl, which Tolkien fiddled with all his life and, of course, uh, translated, the translation being published posthumously. In Pearl, it starts off with a dreamer. And he's still awake at this point, but he's in a graveyard. And he's in a graveyard lamenting what appears to be the death of an infant daughter. And he lies down, very sad, with his head on the grave mound. And then he falls asleep. And, when he, and in the sleep, he goes into a, into a vision. And he finds himself in a strange country. And the, one of the strange things about the country is immediately his sorrow falls away from him. It says, uh, the, it, it got my ghost all grief forget. It made my ghost forget, made my spirit forget all grief. So he was immediately happy, and he walks across this strange country, which has in it a stream, but she's the other side of the river. Where he is, I think, he's in the earthly paradise. Note, earthly paradise. He is not yet in heaven. He's not yet in the heavenly paradise, because if you want to get to that one, there's a river you have to cross. And we all know what river that is, because we have it in our Shire poetry too. One more river, and that's the river of Jordan. One more river, and that's the river to cross. And the river, of course, is the river of death. Now, this scene, I think, is echoed in Lothlorien where the, the characters, the fellowship, enter Lothlorien, very sad because of the death of Gandalf. But as soon as they get into Lothlorien, the grief disappears. Uh, it is a land without grief and a land without stain. And strangely enough, Tolkien makes rather a fuss about rivers at this point. Rather a fuss about rivers, which is quite hard to figure out. The fellowship crosses the Nimrodel, and they wade across it. They can get across with their feet wet. But when it comes to the second river, the silver load, they don't put their feet in the water. They have to go across on the rope walk. And Haldir says, once they've got across the, the river, he says, you have entered the nath of Lorien, or the gore, as you would say. Well, actually, I wouldn't, to tell the truth, Haldir, but there. <laughs> the nath or the gore, as you would say, for it is the land that lies like a spearhead between the arms of silver load and Anduin the Great. Where are they? Well, I would say, once again, they're in the paradis terrestre, in the earthly paradise. But they're also, in a way, in England. But they're in mythic England, because Haldir goes on to say, you're in the angle between the waters, just like the old angle, which the English came from a long, long time ago, the angle between Flensburg Fjord and the river Schlei. I would say that Tolkien's continuing myth is the, with, with the wish for the earthly paradise, the undying land with the trees in it, the undying land where you do not have to leave the earth. It's there in his early poems, like The Happy Mariners or The Nameless Land, which is very carefully written in the extraordinarily difficult stanza uh, form of Pearl. And it's there in late poems, like Imram, The Search for the Undying Lands, which follows the story of St. Brendan the Navigator. It's there in his fiction, in the deep affection for natural beauty, coupled with a feeling that it may be a snare, a tangle. It's tree-tangled Middle Earth. You do not want to get into the tangle. You, want the, you love the trees, but you don't want the tangle. And he's also convinced there is a real myth, by which I mean it was not personal. It wasn't just him. There were other people who'd had it too. And perhaps most of all, there was the nameless poet of Pearl. I will give a few lines from Pearl which I shall read, not only in the original Middle English, but I shall read them in the authentic accent of the area of Cannock Chice, where it comes from, in Staffordshire, which I happen to speak quite well. <laughs> in the foons there stunned and stony stape, as glint through glass that glowed and glicked as stem and strains, when strothmen slape, starring in welkin in winter nicht, that all the low lay made of licht, so dare what's hit a dubberment. Well, I'll do that again, shall I? Uh, <laughs> at the bottom there stand steep stones that shone through the glass, glowing and, and glancing, 
As streaming stars when stroth men sleep, stare in Welkin in winter night. That seems to me to be real Hobbit poetry. It's uh, old, uh, I can translate it word for word, and actually everything in it is understandable except for one word, which I shall turn to. As streaming, streaming stars when stroth men sleep, stare in Welkin in winter night. So that all the area that shone from the light, so splendid was its, uh, was its glowing. However, streaming stars when stroth men sleep. What are stroth men? Well, you should always look these words up in the dictionary, as Tolkien did. Uh, and in this case, Tolkien, in fact, wrote a note on this, which I'm sure is him. The, the edition came out with E.V. Gordon's name on it, but Tolkien had clearly helped E.V. Gordon and clearly held the manuscript for a long time. I think this is a Tolkien note, not an E.V. Gordon note. Anyway, uh, Stroth, says Tolkien in the note, means a marshy land overgrown with brushwood. And it is actually perfectly familiar, not as a, a word, but as a name. There are places like Strother, or Stroud, or Langstrothdale, or the, the familiar surname Bolstrode. These all derive from the same word, Stroth. But the Stroth men, what are the Stroth men? Well, they are the Stroth men looking up at the stars from the dark, low earth. This is the poet's image. Us down here on the dark, low earth, looking up at the stars, or actually, in this case, sleeping, unaware of the stars, which look down on them. Well, who are the Stroth men? We are the Stroth men. We are the people tangled in the brushwood, unable to get out of it, but at the same time able to look up and see the stars outside it. We are the brushwood people tangled in the wood of error, in the close dungeon of innumerous brows. Well, I would say this, uh, finally. Tolkien knew that his love of trees was not universally shared, but he thought that the urge to get out of the wood and reach the stars was universal. He himself wanted to see the stars, but also to stay inside the wood. And his fiction, I think, powerfully expresses both these apparently incompatible beliefs, which he tried very hard to reconcile. I would say, however, that in the end, he knew that in Middle-earth, in tree-tangled Middle-earth, fulfilling both these desires was impossible, except by special grace of God and this side of the river. Thank you.